This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of the world famous Comedy Cellar, coming at you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Comedy, formerly Raw Dog. I am joining, oh, by the way, we also are available as a podcast and on YouTube if you want to see our pretty faces. Some of them are prettier than others, but uh, I'll leave that to you to decide. <laughs> I'm coming at you from the miracle of teleconferencing from Aruba in the Caribbean, about 20 miles north of Venezuela. I am with Noam Dorman, the owner of the world famous Comedy Cellar, coming at you live in studio, along with Perry Alashenbrand. Also remotely, we're being joined by Richard Hanania. How, how far north of Venezuela am I, Dan? <laughs> I'm not, not sure. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, I, I stepped on your intro. Go ahead. Richard Hanania is a writer on social science and geopolitics, the author of The Origins of Woke, and publishes articles at richardhanania.com, where you can subscribe to his newsletter. Thank you for joining us, Richard. How are you today? Doing good. Thanks for having me. Did you mention his book, Dan? Uh, this is the did, bio yeah. that Perry L. sent me. All right. So, uh, so um, listen, I, I met you once years ago, but you've blown up since then. Yeah, um, I was on this show before, right. Yeah, and you... Um, you know, you're, you're a fascinating figure. You you write so many things that I find um, really compelling and original. And uh, um, so, you know, you, you have this uh, recent, first of all, I'm reading your book. Your book is fantastic. So, I mean, let me just talk a little bit. So Yasha Monk wrote a, a book. Yasha is a friend of mine. He wrote a book a bit with his version of how wokeness uh, erupted. And you have your own version of how it erupted that I want to get to later in the interview. But anybody who's read Yasha's book should also read Richard's book. Richard does not agree with Yasha, I think it's fair to say, or he poo-poos some of the importance of some of the things that Yasha says. But I, I find your um, description of wokeness and how it, it was kind of dribbled down from legal laws and stuff like that to be really unbelievably fascinating. I was, I was gripped by it last night reading oh, it. Oh, thank you. So... But let me get to one other thing first. I want to get out of the way. I, I, um, you have an article here, shut up about race and IQ, which is a, which is a position I've, I've come to also. And um, one quote here, it says, while all kinds of individuals accept group differences, in my experience, it's very easy to predict the political views and normative commitments of those who want to talk about them, which casts doubt on the idea that they are animated by passion for scientific inquiry. So I want to start right now with the toughest question because I, I have to ask you, I want to ask you about a controversial tweet that you had on the subject of race. Tell me um, how to explain it and the, and the context of it. I don't want to ambush you with it, but I, I, it, it disturbed me. I, I re you're obviously a, a complex person. I don't know what the explanation is, but it would be wrong to discuss all this outside the context of your own remark, if that's okay with you. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. So you had tweeted, this was about um, Jordan Neely, who was the uh, kind of homeless guy who was killed on the subway by the that Marine who um, acted preemptively, who was then indicted. You wrote... Daniel Penny getting charged. These people are animals, whether they're harassing people in subways or walking around in suits. Now, to, the, to most people, that seems like a comment about black people. What was that all about? It, OK, so I have uh, yeah something like 50,000 tweets. Um, I was not making a comment about black people. I was making a comment on people who commit crimes and people who people who either don't charge the people who commit crimes or charge people who are good Samaritans. So it was in the moment. I was really upset. I couldn't believe Daniel Penny got charged. I thought he believed, I thought he behaved heroically. And it was just like these leftists, you know, the, the people who commit crimes, the people who are, you know, do are part of the system. They're bad. Now I know like you can, I, I, I get it. I, I get like how it looks. Um, but yeah, people, I mean, people, are, people who do bad things, who I dislike. I mean, if, if it was, if it was a black prosecutor who had not charged Daniel Petty, um, obviously I would have said something different. I was upset about the context of what was happening there. Yeah. I, I wondered if that was what you would say. And I, I don't mean that to say, to say, I don't believe you, that it was people on, on both sides. It's complicated by the fact that is it, the, the guy who charged him is black. Um, yeah. 
And um, of course, we can talk about other stuff, but uh, people have to make their own decision. There was a. Go ahead. I mean, look, yeah. I mean, obviously, my problem with the prosecutor, I I don't like left wing prosecutors who charge good Samaritans and don't charge criminals, whatever color they are, right? I mean, I'm obviously upset about, and I understand you can see it as a a code for black people or something. Like, when you write 50,000 tweets, there's going to be a few who are, yeah, I mean, like, I I didn't apologize or delete it or anything. but yeah, I mean, it was about basically the the what was going on. I, I don't call people animals. I mean, I have, I have fifty thousand tweets again. If I was in the habit of calling people animals based on race, um, there'd be stronger evidence. For yeah, that. Th- there was a similar incident with the <coughs> representative Mike Collins. Uh, I think he's from Georgia, yeah. where he tweeted at somebody called Garbage Human about this woman who was Jewish in the Post that. Um, uh, wrote that article about, uh, what was it, about crime or something? Yeah, about how cri- like you shouldn't punish criminals or something like that. And someone said every single time, and I think it was an anti-Semitic thing. Yeah, it's like and a Nazi like, tweeter said, it, 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 there, it's got to be one. And then she said, well, he says, was there ever any doubt? Which sound yeah. like, was it a Jew? And that, that is what the tweet meant. But my I gave him the benefit of the doubt because he was extremely pro-Israel. And who would be self-destructive like that? that that's really, I mean... Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly what the what his meaning was, but I said there's, you know, I said probably he doesn't. Mean he he thought uh, he says that. And by the way, this is the way I read the tweet at first too, not knowing it was from a Nazi. That she was a garbage human for making this argument. That that's how he and in, he interpreted yeah. it. Well, that's how he claims to interpret. It. All right, I don't I don't want to. Uh, so so having said that, so that so that um, everybody can make up their own mind. Tell us why. You think we should shut up about race and IQ, which is a really, you know, it's a serious issue. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of a, it's sort of a, a paradox. I tell people to shut up about it. <laughs> an article about it, and then it's a thing we, it's a thing we talk about. Right. Uh, but this, you know, there's a meta discussion about the discussion. I mean, there is. You know, like there are, there is data out there on like standardized tests, and like some groups do better than others. Um, there's tests on, you know, tests of cognitive ability. I don't think you should care about that unless you are in the habit of seeing people, uh, you know, seeing people as based on their group identity and trying to achieve equal representation uh, between people. If you if you are not interested in that, um, you are interested in treating people as individuals, and there's really not a reason to em- emphasize this stuff. Now, most of the people who do emphasize it, you know, they are they're, they're basically they're, they're white nationalists. They usually have some kind of racialist agenda. They want to restrict immigration. They want whites to have like a kind of identity politics. Um, and so like and sometimes what they what they'll say is, well, the left leftists, they find uh, disparate uh, outcomes between groups. So you have to have an answer to it. And I, I don't I don't I don't buy that. I don't think things are like that logical. I mean, I think you can either emphasize sort of ideas and people and what people can do or you can emphasize group differences. And as long as you got people thinking, um, if you got people sort of in the mode of thinking about group differences and sort of representation, I think that's your problem. I think you're always going to have a problem there. Um, and so I think people should be focused more on the kind of world they want to create, not necessarily the cause of group disparities. Yeah, I very much agree with you. I mean, you know, so when I was a kid in college, I, I wasn't about race, but I wrote a, 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 an essay about how I thought that everything was genetic and um, I didn't talk about, um, I, I talked about IQ, but I was talking about things like the conscience, like what, that, you know, people, everything had to have an evolutionary purpose. And, and obviously everything was a physiological um, manifestation of the brain. And we know we can breed animals for any particular trait. And why would we ever expect that intelligence of, of various kinds wouldn't be? So, so I've always, I was always... Open. This is before the bell curve came out. I was always seemed self-evident that among different gene pools, and by the way, gene pool is not the same as race. I have no idea. We, we, we do a very gross division of people into races without knowing whether they represent gene pools. For instance, Ashkenazi Jews don't seem to be the same gene pool as other white people. And I can only imagine how people of every race break down into different gene pools. But we expect differences in gene pools. But um as you say, it, it's become such an ugly thing that even the smartest people are not able to understand or put in perspective. And um, but there is one thing about it which, in a way, 
might be worth embracing, which is if you accept for the sake of argument the disparity in the bell curve that Asians are 15 points smarter than whites or whites are 15 points smarter than blacks, something like that. The overlap is so enormous, it can't even begin to explain, like, for instance, um, in, in Illinois, there was a headline, not a single child tested proficient in math in 67 Illinois schools, and for reading, it's only 32 schools. Now, there is no interpretation of the worst, in, in, as far as I understand, of the worst studies about IQ which could begin to predict that not a single child would test proficient in math in Illinois schools of any race. So what that means is we are utterly, as a patriotic American, this proves that we are utterly failing our citizens, utterly failing them. Am I wrong? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you're, yeah, yeah. I think I've seen these statistics about uh, like inner city Chicago um, and you know, some people could say, I mean, if you just want to take the, you know, the uh, sort of IQ stuff, so like, well, you have a selection thing where it's like even, you know, the, the inner city ghetto, the, the smart people left and you could f left behind with, you know, a not very smart population. You could, you, you know, you could argue something like that. It shouldn't be zero. <laughs> no be way. Zero. No that's way. Still, that's still a deep cultural. Um, that's still a deep cultural problem. But yeah, I mean, I think we need to have sort of discussions, you know, about like stuff like, you know, what is, you know, what is school for? Like, why, why are, why do we have um, our gene pool didn't change? Um, uh, in the 1960s, right? I mean, there was a, there was a, a, a crime explosion. Sort of a lot of the dysfunction didn't really exist decades past. It goes up and down, you know, by by decades. We had a, a super high violent crime rate in the late 80s, early 90s. Went down for a while. It, it's popped back up uh, the last uh, three or four years. Um, yeah, these questions are things that are worth talking about. And like, you know, if you get the if you if you deal with the crime problem, you don't have to worry about like. You know differences in, in in crime rate, right? I mean, if it's if if you get to the level where you know you have safe streets and you have safe cities, and you know the, this this exists in every continent, um, so every group is potentially capable of it. Um, if one group still has a little bit less performance than other, that doesn't matter. I mean, we should be trying to we should be trying to build a society here uh, that you yeah. know that helps as many people as possible. Well, look, ha having a particular life experience that we're exposed to an awful lot of uh, black people and Hispanic people in my life, I can tell you. I guarantee you, um, doing being proficient in basic math and reading is not possibly something we'd have to worry about. And there is something that really disturbs me on the left and on the right, that they back into arguments which essentially say, we don't believe they can do it. On the right, they're going to point to, um, uh, you know, race and IQ and on the left, they're going to point to systemic racism and, and uh, you know, uh, we're going to get rid of standardized tests. Why do you get rid of standardized tests? Because we don't believe we can educate them to do well on the standardized tests. So let's just get rid of the, the test altogether. And if I were a parent of a person of color, I would be infuriated by this. I, you, you force me to send my kid to these schools. I demand that you teach my kid to read and do math. And by the way, I believe if we could, and I believe it's our only problem, I think if we could get every American child basically on par, grade level in the sixth grade, all our other problems would disappear. That's true, but I, I don't think I'm as optimistic as you about the idea that everyone could learn basic algebra. I, I'm not sure that that's true. I mean, I, I, I I'm sure that a lot of people can if they applied themselves. But I think smart people tend to assume that there's a book by Charles Murray called Real Education. He said, you know, smart people, they set these standards and they assume what, you know, you or I could do, anyone else uh, could do. I don't know if that's true. I mean, I think we should have a society which understands that maybe some people aren't the best, you know, in school. That doesn't mean that racism did something to them. That doesn't mean they're inferior and they can't contribute anything to society. I mean, I think we need better models of, of sort of childhood. And I think there's some states that have been doing some stuff with school choice where they give you vouchers and the parents can decide to send them to a private school or homeschool them uh, or whatever, or send them to an apprentice program or whatever. I think we need to just like accept there's sort of variation there and not a one size fits all approach. So I, I don't know, like, I, I think that like, I think this sort of thing of like, OK, there's school, there's standards. We just got to use the government schools to get everyone up to the standards. I, 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 I'm sympathetic to the idea that that really hasn't worked. Richard, in your article on Substack about this topic, I think you said something which sort of encapsulates 
uh, your reasoning as to why we shouldn't discuss this at all. You said that uh, those who would want to discuss it uh, do so on the basis of um, convincing the other side that indeed uh, disparities are not due to racism. And, and you said something like where there's a woke agenda, uh, people will find a way. Well, I forgot the exact quote, but but your basic uh, notion was is that no matter what you say, the people that are convinced that racism is the reason for disparity will always be convinced of it. And people that are convinced that uh, genetics are the basis of disparity will always be convinced of that. There's no changing anybody's yeah. mind on it. And it's, yeah, and it's even it's even harder than that because even if you could, even if somehow you got leftists to say like it's it's genetic, it's not racist, they'll just go to indigenous ways of knowing. I mean, that there is like a you know there is there's all this like science itself, measurement itself. I mean, if they want to be left wing, if they want to be woke, they'll find a way. It doesn't depend on uh, sort of your scientific assumptions or scientific findings at all. So and we'll leave this in a second. So getting back to your initial point that um, really that these arguments are made by people who have another agenda. I read Charles Murray book, Charles Murray's book, um, uh, Facing Reality. I don't know if you read that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it really angered me. I really felt he had let the mask down and he was really into a full blown, I thought, anti-black argument you know essentially blaming genetics for crime genetic that, that, you know what is even the title face reality it's like face reality mrs dorman your child will never walk you know it's like you know and then he went on andrew sullivan's podcast and he said um i just found this in an old email andrew if i had to say there's one concept that's really simple that people cannot get through their heads it's the concept of different means, but overlapping distributions, which would be the idea that, you know, even if even if the average IQ is different among populations, that 90 or 95 percent of them are indistinguishable. So he's he acknowledges that this is an idea that people can't get through their heads. And yet he's hammering it home. He wants to unleash this on the entire population so they will have the uh, confirmation bias that every time they see somebody underperforming, yeah. they're going to think it's because they just face reality. They just can't do it. This is not the act of a patriot. I, I really, I really think it's not. In, unless there's yeah. something you think good is going to come from it. What are you doing? And he won't, yeah. he won't stop this thing. I mean, he's been doing it for 20 years already. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm more on your side that obviously I wrote that article that, you know, it's probably just best not to talk about this stuff. At the same time, I get I'm a little more, you know, understanding of sort of where Charles is coming from on this. He thinks it's an answer to the left. Mm -hmm. He's thinking like, I'm not going to get it into your head that blacks are this or Hispanics are that. His, I think his reasoning is that leftists think and their entire justification for what they do is that there's disparate outcomes, therefore uh, structural racism, therefore we have to get rid of algebra, therefore the schools are screwed up, therefore the cops are racist, if the cops arrest one group over the other. Um, th that means, you know, that means we have to sort of refix society. So he, he thinks he sees this as sort of a left wing agenda. Um, I get the argument. I mean, it's not a, it's not a crazy argument. So his argument would be, um, let's like tell people that there are group differences, but you know, don't don't go and assume, you know, every person who's of, of a certain race uh, is a criminal or can't do, you know, homework or, or something like that. You know, and then my uh, and then I think what you're saying is you're you're asking too much. You're asking you're, you want to you say face reality. Races are very different. It's very <laughs> important. Now, keep in mind, right? It, it's too complicated. I, people just think of these sort of very simplistic terms, and yeah, you know, I mean, it's just it, really, you know, that, is, that that itself is something he has to accept. Th there's a real psychology. We're all human, so I, it's a story by analogy. I have a friend of mine whose son was um, uh, uh, evaluated to have a very low IQ, <clears throat> and um, with all kinds of other you know, things, conditions that have acronyms. And um, his parents were warned to, you know, have very low expecta expectations for this child. And um, the father being more rational, I think, had come to grips with that. And the mother, being more feminine, wouldn't accept it. And the end of the story is that child is at, is at um, Dartmouth University now. You know, not, not with any kind of special program. He actually is at Dartmouth University. The mother never gave up. And um, that's a, that's, that, there's a powerful lesson there. You know, you just, you just, you don't know, but just because yeah. somebody says it doesn't make it true about your child.
You know, when I was in high school, my freshman year, I never tested low IQ or anything like that, but I was like class, class rank 390 out of 410. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, my GPA was like 0.5. And I, it's not like I couldn't do the work. I was just, you know, stupid. I, I wouldn't go to class. I wouldn't do the homework. Um, it would have, you probably would have been very unlikely that I'd be writing popular articles uh, as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, you're right. I, I think there is a... Um, Look, look, on average, you have a group of kids who test low IQ and a group of kids who test high IQ. The kids who test high IQ will do much, much better. Of course, of course. On average. Um, at the same time, there is, I think, probably, you know, it's better to be, it, it, well, there's so much uncertainty in the world. It's just better to be, it, you're going to be irrational no matter what. It's better to be on the side of, I think, irrational uh, confidence, exuberance, optimism rather than the opposite because you're going to be irrational no matter what because you're not smart enough to sort of you know calculate the odds precisely and i think that's sort of what that story look 99 times out of 10 that kid wouldn't have got to Harvard, to be honest but what time out of 10 he did right. and maybe having that belief is is adaptive right but all right and it, it just it's a i just feel america it, it just can't it, it just can't chalk off its citizens this way especially when we know that we like, you know, elite person, like would never in a million years allow my child to be sent to a school on the order of the way the other children are going to school, you know, but are we, are we, I mean, like this whole thing where you write some children off because they can't do elsewhere. It's too, it's too narrow. You like have these illegal, you know, these illegal uh, Mexicans coming from Mexico, people coming from Central America, and they're probably not, you know, they don't have much of an education. They probably can't, you know, they probably won't do great in the classroom, but those people are productive. I mean, they're working, you know, they're working, they're building things. You're seeing them in service jobs. You're seeing them doing something valuable for society. They're happy. I mean, they're, compared to their living standards in Mexico and Honduras. They're living a great life too. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think we should like, we put too much emphasis on, you know, it, it, we put too much emphasis on school, even this conversation, like, oh, some people can't do it. Therefore they suck and they can't do it. They, look, I know people who are very good in school. I was in academia. They're wasting their lives. They're sitting there. You've seen some of the crap that comes out of academia. They're using their big brains to just produce drivel that they put <laughs> on a page. The world is not better off. They're living off, you know, uh, uh, these uh, over overpriced tuition. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that just like we we value school learning too much. So no, I'm, go ahead, Dan. Well, uh, just in keeping with your uh, this notion that we shouldn't write off our citizens, are we not writing off our citizens to some extent when when we argue that immigration is good because we need doctors, we need engineers? You know, you hear sometimes this argument. That that the native born are, are not sufficiently, uh, you know, uh, adept at at, at, at science. <clears throat> well, I don't, I don't think it's zero sum. I don't think there's like you know, uh, ten thousand science jobs a, a year or something like that, right? It's it's a growing population. I mean, it's it's uh, you know, there's innovation. There's different things. If you have you know low wage immigration, they're going to need to do jobs for someone else. So I, I don't think it's necessarily writing off citizens to be a, to have an open immigration policy. Some people might talk like that, but I, I don't think that's the best justification for it. And, and don't get me wrong, I, I'm, I'm, we're probably kindred spirits in the following way. When I know that the, the thing I'm not allowed to say would expose the fact that the the other side is full of shit and hypocritical. It's very difficult to to not be attracted to that. So, like for instance, you know, we have a, we have a situation where Jews um, are very successful, right? They're 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 uh, overrepresented in science and blah blah blah. And you have two possible explanations: genetics or culture. I don't think there's any other. And both those explanations are verboten. <laughs> right. You can't, so so when you know that both explanations are verboten, you understand that th what's being suppressed here is any intelligent conversation of things. And by the way, if it's cultural, maybe you need want to make the argument that oppression is a boost for for for, uh, you know, performance. But anyway, so it so it is a, it, it, it is, a, you know, very upsetting that you can't talk about it. So I, I, I like that you talk about it. And I, and I I I would never fault anybody for talking about it. But when I sniff that agenda and that agenda not only seems cruel, but actually anti-American, I, it just, I get, I get quite turned off. And yeah. There's nothing wrong with sort of, I mean, there, look, there are people who should just be out there and just be telling the truth of whatever, you know, whatever the, they think is the best explanation of what we see in the world. But your instinct that like, 
you're choosing to highlight something, so there's probably a reason for it. And people should just be, you know, honest about these things. I think that instinct is, is absolutely correct. Now, you, when you were younger, you were in the thrall of some of these horrible people, right? Yeah, so you, that's, so, well, that's yeah, that's why I know. I speak from I speak from some uh, experience. Do, can right. you tell us a little bit about that insight? Um, so yeah, I mean, I wrote, I mean, I wrote some, uh, articles, you know, uh, anonymously for some like far right websites. Um, it was, uh, you know, people could, people can look it up if they like, but I, you know, I was coming from an unhappy place. I mean, I, I wrote about sort of where I was and I think that like, you know, we don't, we don't like to, I think, admit that how much sort of our personal feelings, um, and our sort of what we're going through in life sort of influences our politics. But I've always thought these things were sort of, uh, intertwined. And I think there's just like, you know, realizing that and then realizing like, look, there's, if you can't, you, you don't write people off. Like you said, you don't write people off just because you think, you know, some group doesn't, have, you know, might not be, have a, a, a per capita basis might not become doctors as much as the other group. I think there are sort of positive things we could be thinking about that we can help all people uh, in the country. And, you know, that's what I'd like to focus on instead. So, you know, if people are having trouble deciding whether, you know, how they feel about that tweet I mentioned, I would tell them to read up, read, read this uh, article, shut up about race and IQ. Um, it's so detailed. It's, it's so compelling. And you'd have to be some sort of evil genius to be able to come up with all these insightful arguments for the other side when actually secretly you you feel the way uh, the the tweet uh, indicates. So I, I you know for that reason I, I I I find it hard to believe that you're not being straight with us. So where where are you on immigration? Uh, I'm I'm pro a um, I'm pro a pretty accepting immigration uh, policy. Um, I think that you know the, you know the I, I believe the standard economic argument that more people is better. I mean there's a there's just a better workers, more workers, um, you know, there's a, uh, you stimulate demand, you, you, uh, do all that. I mean, there's just a very basic sort of economic argument. I think the cultural arguments that people worried about, I think they're overrated. Even I've traveled in Europe, um, met foreigners and I'm amazed sort of like how American, even like people in foreign countries are. <laughs> and so the idea that like, you know, Mexicans in America are like not going to assimilate in the culture. I think that's, uh, I think that's hard to believe. I mean, you see how sort of, you see even the, even people worry about politics, like it's a permanent, you know, Elon Musk says this sometimes they're permanent democratic voters. Not really. I mean, the last few polls, you know, Know, uh, Trump is winning Hispanics over Biden. Who would have predicted this, right, four years ago, that going with Trump would be the thing <laughs> that balanced out Hispanics between Republicans and Democrats? Um, and so, a lot of things people worry about, I don't think, are, are that are, the, are that big of a deal. You might worry about, okay, it's uh, it's uh, it's sort of disorderly, the you know illegal immigration. I, I, you know, in a practical terms, there's no um, there's no sort of a um, uh, like uh, negotiation on the table that's going to increase immigration. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm just not worried about it as, as far as a real uh, big problem for society. So in an interview you did with uh, Amy Wax, who, let me tell you, we did an interview with Amy Wax years ago and she was so. She's uh, got, yeah, she's got, she's got something. Yeah. She, and this was in the height of wokeness and she, and she was so jarring in the things she was saying, not necessarily what she was saying, but the unapologetic, like in your face, what, yeah. that I actually she's didn't. Belly of the beast. I mean, she's a she's at a, a top law school. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't run the podcast. I hope I don't know if you even know because I I just thought it, it was, was just going to explode. What's that? Was it like summer twenty twenty when everyone everyone was sort of freaking out? Uh, it was even prior to that. It was when the first the thing at Penn first broke. Um, I still have it somewhere. I, I just couldn't believe that she didn't have the, just the, 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 the sense to couch her statements and disclaimers like any, any rational person does. Anyway, but she said in a podcast with you, which is really good, and, and her podcast with Glenn Lowry, I mean, you're talking about good, I mean, really provocative in terms of having to weigh the, the idea of, like, well, if something is true, is that an absolute defense to be to being able to say it. And these are, this is a very, I, I'm still struggling with that. But she said that um, American or Western culture is liberty oriented and Asian culture is conformist. And she worried that there was a critical mass where if you bring too many people of a different culture, that you then change our culture in a way which we wouldn't want to, or we would certainly never vote to do. What did you make of that argument? Yeah, so me and Amy have had a few podcasts on this, and we've gone back and 
forth on it. I, I've always sort of thought that, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the horse is already out of the barn. I mean, if you're worried about new groups in America changing the culture, look, I mean, if you look at like, you know, children being born today, you know, only something like half are white, um, maybe a slight majority. Um, and the white population is everything from Jews to Sicilians to Russians to, to Swedes to Arabs are considered white in this country, everything in between. Um, and so like the idea, so like we're there. If you don't like multiculturalism, if you don't like multilingualism, if you don't want multiracial society, we are there. Just the kids being born today, whites are going to be a minority. I mean, that's just happening. And whites is already a huge category that includes um, a lot of people. Um, and so we are not in a situation where ch we're choosing now between homogeneity and diversity. We're already, we're already in diversity. And so the question becomes, how do diverse groups learn to live with each other? Now, I do have another article where I said diversity really is our strength, where I argued that actually you get um, you get more of you get a freer society because when you have these different cultural groups because often it's cultural solidarity that gets you a big welfare state everyone you know sympathizes with the poor so everyone trusts the government these Scandinavian countries they they've traditionally been homogenous they have high levels of trust they have giant welfare states and they're poor relative to the United States I don't think the welfare state is a good thing um, and so yeah I think that Amy is uh, uh, I don't think we have a choice at this point how diverse we're going to be and um, I think we just got to make the best of it. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, I understand the argument. Like, for instance, I'm Jewish. I'm very thankful that America is so kind to Hasidic Jews and they, and they live their lives with liberty. But I certainly do understand that it's some critical mass. That's her phrase. I've used that phrase, too. And some critical mass, America might say, listen, we can't have 30 million Hasidic Jews here because it's just going to drastically change the way yeah. we live. Now, they're an extreme example because they live so differently. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm a huge yeah, fan of we, most cultures. Yeah. I mean, we're lucky. We, we were not, you know, some European countries. I mean, they're all, all their immigrants are Muslims and they're in huge numbers. And so, that you know, that they're going to be, you know, 30 percent Muslim or something. That could potentially be a problem because it's a different culture and it's such big numbers. Uh, we're sort of lucky in that it's very widely distributed. It's all kinds of you got liberal cultures and you got conservative cultures. And, you know, nobody is going to have a democratic demographic dominance in this country. So, you know, what's the worry? Also, people love to be American and diversity. You know, um, you in your book describe how the concept of diversity was basically invented out of whole cloth in the, the Backey decision by Powell, I guess it was, um, how that was like the compromise decision. Nobody really even talked about diversity prior to that. But be that as it may, he is right. Diver he didn't say diversity is but diversity. I mean, I, I sometimes so I'm in New York and I'm conservative about a lot of things. And I'll look at my restaurant and you have gay people and straight people and Chinese people and Indian people and black people and everybody and not just tables, but all at mixed tables of mixed people and whatever. And everybody's yeah. socializing and having a great time, albeit without any scarcity or anything to to bring out the worst in them. And it could bring tears to your eyes. I mean, no, nobody can say that a diverse culture can't work. They, yeah. We, I mean, we, yeah. we can say there's challenges to making yeah. it work, but clearly it can work. Well, I, I think one thing is true is when white people are a minority, I, I, I expect there to be less uh, sort of allegiance to the founders of this country. Uh, the founding fathers, I think, are going to find themselves uh, uh, having a less prominent place in the sort of the national the national civic religion. Um, I don't know how much longer they can last. We had some, we, we did a podcast known recently with a woman who was Asian and she didn't want her child to dress up as Martha Washington because yeah. Martha Washington was a white woman. And she wanted her child to dress up as, as an Asian American of prominence. And, and you took her to task saying, well, no, Martha Washington is part of the American mythology and, and, and we should all embrace it. Well, I said, I, I, found it, I found it painful that she felt that way. What do you think, say, Richard? Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there is a sort of human nature and like you look at the founders and, you know, they don't look like you and maybe you feel less of a connection to that. Um, you know, at the same time, I mean, like humans can get over this. I mean, like basket, like basketball, like professional, like ba American basketball is like, from what I hear, huge in like China. And like mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un, like loves Michael Jordan, right? Dennis Rodman visited him. He was a big thing. So people obviously do have a capacity um, to associate with people who 
um, uh, who don't look like them and who and to identify with them and to even, you know, to, to see them heroically and look at white kids, look up to rap, black rappers and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think you, I think this could be overcome. I mean, I think we have a problem where we're sort of, I mean, I don't know if this is like a problem with immigrants. I mean, I think that the younger generations are sort of getting away from American ideals anyway. But I think the immigrants are probably going to assimilate into, into what the dominant culture tells them about the founders. You go to you know public school, <laughs> they're not exactly you know they're not exactly instilling the idea that the you know uh, American history is all that great. Yeah, well, I mean, I have two experiences with this. So one was a, uh, well, the first one was I used to have a Korean girlfriend. She was off the boat Korean and her family and. Um, uh, we, I remember it was November and she invited me over to her house for Thanksgiving. And I said, your parents celebrate Thanksgiving. And she's oh, absolutely. It's very important to them. And that, I, I, you know, I, I, my heart overflowed with love of immigrants. So I was like, well, how beautiful is it? That's some, they don't even speak English. They're Koreans. They come here and they want to be American. And, you know, Thanksgiving is, is, but then this fast forward to a much more elite Asian. She was a therapist and it's talk, like talking about the metastasizing of stupid thinking. She, her argument, it just came back to me, was, well, you know, it's like blackface. And I'm like, no, it's not like blackface. Blackface was when white people were mocking black people. It was cruel and mocking. This would be your Asian daughter dressing up as a white person because she's a hero or, you know, a founding figure. It has nothing to do with blackface, but they, but they inter over, uh, uh, superimpose some semblance so they don't think it through. It sounds kind of familiar. And then anybody dressing up as anybody now is an insult, right? It's crazy. Yeah. I mean, America is the most successful, I mean, country in, in human, the most powerful, successful country in human history. I think people naturally want to identify with that. And you sort of have to sort of have this kind of liberal BS. You have to send them to college, you know, in order for them to have, to feel the other way. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think if we had confidence in ourselves, I don't think this would be much of a problem. Confidence in yourself is very interesting because when I was in Korea, this was again in the 90s, but I noticed that Literally, there was no time of day where either by turning on the radio or turning on the TV or just going to a restaurant where you didn't hear Western classical music. And I thought to myself at the time, what a confident culture to so embrace the music of another culture as the highest form of, of music. Like you, 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 you do that with confidence, you know, and it was very I find that very beautiful. Yeah, uh, but look you, at even how they look at how, I mean, look at how like business attire, right? They weren't all wearing suits and ties in Korea a hundred years ago. I mean, the fact that they even adopted sort of the way Westerners dress is, is interesting. Yeah. Um, next question, um, Israel. Now, now you're, you're Arabic descent from the name. I don't know anything about your bio. Yeah, my dad's a uh, Palestinian Christian, and my mom is a uh, Jordanian. Yeah, Jordanian also Christian. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, of course. I mean, in the Arabs, you would not find a Muslim Christian. Uh, you would maybe occasionally, but maybe a Muslim husband. But if my dad was Christian, my my mom would have to be Christian. It wouldn't be a, a Christian man with a Muslim. Yeah, I know, I know a Palestinian Israeli who married a, a Jewish girl. Anyway, but you're right. It's on you. So yeah, no, the girl, the girl is fine. The girl will take after the husband. I think that is the point. So it has to be Muslim man with other not not other way around. Yeah, I think that's right. So um, you're you're quite pro Israel. And you wrote a column, I forget the name of it, essentially putting forward the idea. It's kind of like Jabotinsky's Iron Wall essay, which had motivated Netanyahu through his entire career, that the, the Palestinians won't make peace until they feel they have no choice. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I think that's yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think the Hamas strategy is and this has always been Palestinian strategy to some extent is to rely on um uh, global opinion to sort of pressure Israel um, into behaving differently. Um, and, you know, and, and so the, as long as there is sort of a hope out there that the, and, and, you know, you have to ask what are sort of the Palestinian goals? I think Hamas, I mean, I think it's clearly, you know, there's not a positive sort of a spin you could put on what they actually want. They don't really, uh, they don't really hide it. Um, and so as long as you have this sort of equilibrium uh, where, you know, they can attack, 
um, then they can hide behind civilians and you really can't root them out and you can't really, you know, take the fight to them. Um, that's just going to be a sort of a permanent festering wound. And, you know, down the line, I mean, it's going to become harder and harder. You know, Hamas is going to build up more capabilities. Um, they're going to be able to better prepare for next time. And as long, you know, if you're not willing to sort of fight this war, I mean, eventually it, it's, it's not a sustainable situation. I think October 7th uh, showed us that. Um, so yeah, my view is Israel has to win the war. I mean, this is at least as important to them as uh, much more important to them than World War II was to us. Um, and, you know, we don't beat ourselves, we don't flog ourselves over World War II, even though we flog ourselves over a lot of other things. Um, and uh, yeah, I think Israel has to win. I think it should have the full support from the U.S. I may made point in, oh, sorry. go ahead, Dan. Sorry, you made the point in your article. Uh, you you um, took to task those who say that Israel's treatment of the Palestinians is simply going to create more terrorists because for each terrorist killed, five terrorists that are their their, their relatives and their friends are going five Palestinians that are their relatives and friends of those killed will become terrorists. But you made the point that Palestinians' hatred of Israel is already maxed out. There's no way to make them hate Israel more. So don't worry about it. I, I, yeah, I think I, I, re- I think that's rough. Yes, that's what he said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, it, you do get to the point where like, OK, you have a complete societal consensus. I mean, you look at the approval rating for like October 7th and you look at, you know, uh, other things like this. It, it, you can't really make them hate you that much. They're they're sort of maxed out on it. And it's not because like Israel has not killed until this war. I mean, by like world standards. Israel has not killed as many Palestinian people as they as they could have or as as many other countries do when they're in a war situation. If you look at, you know, Syria, if you look at what the Chinese did to the Uyghurs, um, you know, I think that people don't like to admit it, but it's it's pure anti-Semitism. They don't like a Jewish state. Um, It's a religious motivation. And so this goes against the idea that it's like. You know, you turn down the oppression, you give them, you know, you give them more rights, they're going to somehow come to the peace table. Like, no, I, I think that Palestinian society is mobilized and Hamas and the leadership especially um, to win, to kick the Jews out and to have the land, to bring the land under Islamic control. I, I don't think that there's any reason to think that's not the case. You know, maybe the reason I, I find you smart is because you say things that uh, I think. <laughs> yeah, like I'm, but um, <laughs> That's the best measure of I had a similar conversation with David Rothkopf, uh, the the foreign uh, foreign user edit foreign policy magazine, and I asked him, "Is um, Israel more or less existentially threatened by Hamas?" than we were by the Japanese. And he said, oh, no, we were more threatened by the Japanese, which, which I thought was crazy. But then I said to him, on this issue of creating more terrorists, I think it was to him, that fine. But, you know, I said, I put it this way. I said, so maybe Hamas goes to 11. You know, I think this one goes to 11 because it really seems like their, their hatred of Israel has been at a 9 or 10 for a long time. But maybe it goes to 11. But does anybody ever stop and think about the fact that Israel used to be at a 1? Like, you're all worried about the psychology of what's being created in Hamas. What about the psychology that's being created in the Israelis? Is There was never hundreds of thousands of Palestinians marching for peace now. There was an entire left-wing peace movement that was destroyed psychologically. And nobody ever makes that argument against the the Arabic behavior. I don't understand that. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's sort of a... I don't know. It's sort of like Israel is considered sort of a civilized country. Therefore, you can appeal to their better angels. So like they're having a democratic debate. You could hope to influence them while Palestinians are just if you're a dissident under Hamas, you know, you get thrown in a dungeon somewhere. I think that's the sort of the psychology, but the the right response. So maybe it's rational, like you can influence Israel in the West, but we can't influence the Palestinians. But the lesson of that isn't just you nag Israel, <laughs> the Palestinians do what you want. It's like there's a serious problem with the Palestinians. Um, and this is a, you know, this is in many ways a, a broken um, kind of society. And uh, yeah, Israel has to live next to them and they have to figure out what to do about it. They should make us sympathetic to Israel's case, the fact that Palestinians are not you know, sort of amen- amenable to reason. All right, let, let me issue a few uh, d- disclaimers that are not just pro forma because I, I believe them and I know that it's. Very cruel to live, even in the West Bank. It's very harsh. And without regard to how how that situation is brought about by the ridiculous policies of the leadership, I know people who, you know, I I know people who tell me stories that I believe of really um, 
arrogant and uh, horrible treatment under the yoke of the Israeli occupation, and it fills them with anger in the same way, and maybe more severely as many black Americans are filled with anger at the police, not because they shoot innocent people, but because of the arrogant way they're, they're treated day to day. Uh, one can only imagine what the people of Gaza are going through. And I actually... I'm ready to sign on the dotted line that Israel is absolutely correct for its aim to get rid of Hamas. I don't think they have any choice. I'm not ready to sign on the dotted line that the way they're conducting the war is with the least brutality that's possible. I hope it is. I, I don't think that it's not, at least not, uh, I'm sure in certain cases, in certain decisions, but I don't, in the overall, I don't think they're, they're faking it when they say they're trying to re reduce... Uh, civilian casualties, if only for their own self-interest and for, to, you know, to keep their relationship with Washington well. But I, we won't know that until later. I wonder, so Nicholas Kristof and other people have made the argument, listen, I don't know what they should be doing differently, but I know this is not okay. 30, 000, I know that 30,000 people is not okay. What, what, what do you answer to that argument? Yeah, I mean, it's so easy. I mean, to say <laughs> this is, I have no alternative, but, you know, this is not okay. I mean, there, there, it's not every choice is easy. I mean, not every sort of, you know, sometimes you have unacceptable sort of differences. And I don't think, it, you know, that's crazy. I mean, that uh, the Rothkopf told you that the Japanese threatened the uh, U.S. in the uh, 1940s more than uh, uh, the Palestinians or Hamas threatens Israel today. I mean, they're firing rockets at their cities. I mean, they they Japanese couldn't do a raid and, you know, kidnap women and America and take them to Japan. I mean, they had a, they had an attack on Hawaii, you know, in the middle of the Pacific. Oh, it's crazy. And 150,000 rockets in the north and Iran in the in the east. I mean, it's crazy to think that it, you can't compare. Absolutely can't compare. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah, completely. I mean, and then you have just the, you know, they're twice. Japan is on the other side of the world. The you know, Palestinians are, are right there. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, countries have to survive. I mean, I don't think that like, look, I don't think if you had this, if you look, if you had a blanket rule that you could never kill Palestinian civilians, um, it's terrible to say, but I think that would be then I think that would be the end of Israel because mm -hmm. Hamas would know forever they all they have to do is hide behind civilians, right. no matter how many rockets they lob at Israel, no matter how many October seventh do a do a do a raid and you know take some women back every few years. They'll never you know they'll say Nicholas Kristof in the world will, of the world will come and say you know you can't kill children. It's 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 a terrible situation, um, but you know I'm convinced that it would be the end of Israel. So I think they have to sort of be able to fight this war. Oh, I, I agree with you, and you know ex it, the term existential threat gets used a lot, but nobody really knows what it means. But but a country that has to live every other day in bomb shelters and ha has its army reservists call up you know, indefinitely uh, at the whim of a gang that can press a button, and set, that, that is an existential threat even to, to the way any country would ever live it doesn't mean they're all going to die or there's no more country but but no country can live that way um as for christoph's argument i i i have made the argument in certain you know situations in my own life where i said listen i don't know how you fix this problem but i know this can't be the right answer and i was like well these customers are unhappy yeah boss but you have said they had to be because well, i said listen i don't want to hear it customers are unhappy this guy so you better figure it out so i don't have i don't totally disrespect i don't have total disrespect for that way of thinking kind of working backwards from a from a facially unacceptable outcome to say listen you got to come up with a better way but we're months into this war Basically, any expert in the world will pick up the phone when Nicholas Kristof calls, and he's a journalist. By this point, he should have done the due diligence to be able to say, listen, I looked into this, and actually there are certain alternatives that they could be doing. If at Four months into whatever it is, to simply saying, oh, they should, I don't know, but they shouldn't be doing this, at, at some point it, it, it becomes unserious. I don't want to call him anti-Semitic. I don't think he's anti-Semitic, but it's, I don't know what you call it, but... Maybe he shouldn't be writing for the Times anymore. It's it's just not a serious person. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I I agree with you. I do think that there is, you know, you can say, 
you, you know, you, I mean, you, there, everything is unacceptable. Everything sounds terrible because Israel is in a terrible situation. So, yes, that I think does put the burden on you. And obviously, if you have the resources and time to look into it, yeah, to have another solution. I don't think you can just say we can't. Richard, can I ask you, um, as, as somebody who may or may not have their ear to the ground regarding the Arab American community, how many uh, Arab Americans or Arabs in general or Arab Christians are, are of, your, of your of your opinion regarding this conflict? You know, Arab Christians are sort of, of you know, I, I think Arab Muslims are probably, you know, uh, completely with the Palestinians. Arab Christians, some of them are not big fans of Muslims, uh, to be to be frank. Um, a lot of them came from Muslim countries and 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 are probably not sympathetic to the Palestinians uh, at all. Um, so, like, yeah, even in my family, there's there's the entire spectrum of opinions on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, question. It's pretty closely divided. Um, do you want to you want to give us a little overview? If, if you have a nutshell version of it of how wokeness came to be, and whether you think we're past peak woke. Your book was written before the Supreme Court outlawed racial preferences in colleges. I don't know, but your new edition might have something to say about that. So, you know, however you want to address that that issue. Yeah, I mean, so my book, you know, in a, in a nutshell, um, I hope people get it, and because it's 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 tough to do justice, uh, you know, to, uh, just quickly. Um, but yeah, the idea is that a lot of the stuff that we think of as wokeness, that we think is cultural, um, has a legal basis. That if you run a business in this country, if you're a college, you've had the government breathing down your neck for a really long time, asking you to classify your employees, your students, whatever, uh, by race, by sex, uh, to to cure any imbalances, to not give tests if one group does better than the other. This is so baked into American governance. It came from executive orders. It came from uh, interpretations of the Civil Rights Act. I'd say well, well, this stuff is usually is not actually in the text of the Civil Rights Act, but it's been read that way and some of the civil rights laws uh, that came later. Um, and, you know, I, the, the co corollary to that is that you can actually fix a lot of this through policy. So the Supreme Court decision um, it, um, from uh, uh, the, the, the Harvard decision over the summer, I mean, that that is a good first step. There was just, just the other day, um, there was a decision uh, out of a court in Texas that got rid of um, uh, a minority business set aside. So basically the government for 55 years have said, if you're a minority small business, government can do special favors for you, can give you special contracts, uh, can help you in, in ways that they don't help uh, other businesses. Um, and a lot of this stuff is, I mean, I, I do think we are getting past that. First, there's a few things going on. First of all, there's the legal stuff. I mean, uh, the stuff that Chris Rufo is doing, uh, my book, the ideas that are out there, the uh, just the Trump appointments on the Supreme Court, conservatives having a lot of power in the judiciary. So there's the there's the legal aspect of this. Um, I think probably just as big is uh, Elon Musk buying uh, Twitter. Twitter sort of, you know, it, it's not perfect. I mean, a lot of Nazis and a lot of porn, a lot of a lot of pussy in bio. I mean, it's probably the most common phrase on, on Twitter these days. Uh, but still, I mean, there's there's more of a sort of a, there's a sort of more parity between the two sides. So these conservative boycotts of like Bud Light and Target, they suddenly started working. When the there was new um, there was new management at Twitter and my own account I you know I, I feel you know more free and I think a lot of people feel that way too and just just because like you know this we, this stuff goes in cycles anyway because like you try wokeness I mean we you know we try the idea of like criminals are actually innocent victims of society and let's toss out all standards and it doesn't go well I mean mm -hmm. we had that big uh, crime wave that really went from the 60s all the way to the late 1980s we, we started clamping down on crime in the 1990s we forgot those lessons then came you know BLM and George Floyd uh, and all of that so yeah for now I think we're going in the right direction I think that changing the law is potentially help is a way to potentially get us out of the cycle so it doesn't you know in 10 15 years we're not the same place we started at by the way the the ivy league university is getting back to the um, they're bringing back the sat that's right um, it, uh, just brown university i think dartmouth did it and yale um, mit did it before that and then i think there's one other i think I yale i think yale yeah yeah exactly yeah so so they're not uh you know this shows um they're not as crazy as you might think <laughs> they are they are crazy but they're they're not going to flush their credibility down the toilet they're they're self-interested enough to to remain credible institutions yeah well one painful thing it's very painful to see the pendulum swing into a, a, a absurdum but then of course people live in absurdum for a while and, and inevitably they're like what the fuck is this so, you know it's amazing how quickly they re-embrace the sats it must it must have been a five alarm fire yeah, I was talking to somebody at Penn actually who took a little, who took a leave of absence, came back and said 
there was something different about the students. I mean, they were not, it was, it was noticeable uh, to this person because standardized tests are the only way, you know, everyone gets a 4.0 these days. Um, you don't have standardized tests. You don't really have standards. It's the only way to judge people fairly. Of course. I mean, it, it was, it was madness. Uh, so a few things in, in your book, you just reverberated with me. First of all, as a business owner, the stats on how basically every Fortune 500 company has been sued for millions of dollars for harassment and, and, and all this. Um, just the, the idea that there's you know, an army of employees out there with visions of causes of actions. Dang, like was, was that from the night before Christmas? Visions of causes of actions dancing in their head. Um, and this is really true. We've, we've had a little experience here with a stupid uh, flare up we had here about whether people could be on um, standby for their shifts. Turned out we were 100% compliant with the law, but everybody was Googling and they were passing around on it and they became lawyers and, and, you know, and it was a whole mutiny until I realized, until they realized, oh, that was just a proposed law. It had never been passed. And it was like, but, but I mean, the, the, the ardor to catch the boss and to sue for something, this is, this is real. And then you make, you make an additional really insightful point that the ambiguity both of the complex caused by the complex descriptions in the law where each word is ambiguous. And then, so the employers don't know what's okay and what's not okay. And then, and I, when something is ambiguous, you don't get anywhere near it. Like we've talked about this years ago. Like if you know where the line is drawn, where the cliff is, you can walk right up to the cliff and look over it. Cause you know where the cliff is. But if you don't know where the drop is, you're not getting within 20 feet of where it might be. And this is the way employers are, are operating now. We all operate scared. And half the time, 70% of the time, when I, when if I have a tough thing I'm not sure about, and I'll call my employment practices attorney, like, is this okay to do? They'd be like, I don't know. <laughs> you know, you think the, they don't know. So you, so you try, you just don't take the chance. This is no way to run a business, right? So you, your book is excellent on that. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah the idea is that like, you know, it's ambiguous, a hostile work environment. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, sexual harassment. People flirt. You know, it's not like there's a ban on flirting or dating. It's just there's, you know, if, if it's you know severe and uh, pervasive. You know, well, what does that mean? Who knows, right? And you know, who who interprets civil rights laws? I mean, they're not, you know, they're not, you know, freewheeling, you know, shock jocks or, or comedians or something like that. I mean, they're people who have a broad definition of racism and sexism, and all they've got to do is convince a jury or convince a judge or convince a bureaucrat um, that you did something wrong and it's no wonder you know 100 percent of you know the the top corporations end up either getting sued or settled because there's there's no way around this even you have statistical discrimination right you have the the uh you know they treated me unfairly then you have you have some measure of employment you have some uh, kind of standard people have to meet and some groups do better than other that's also a problem too so you can get everyone on everything i mean this sort of cultural idea that corporations are these super sanitized place where everyone is sort of neurotic and working on eggshells uh the law made it that way i mean there is a pretty direct connection between what the law says and just sort of how institutions operate and ultimately like what we experience, which we call this thing, you know, political correctness or wokeness. Um, two, two more quick things. What, one thing with that is we also, one of these, you know, obvious contradictions that nobody wants to uh, really talk about is the contradiction between feminism and the obvious protection, pr protectionist way, or that's not the right word, but you know, the, 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 uh, careful way we assume that women have to be treated, which is different than the way men have to be treated, the hostile work environment, remarks. I mean, I mean you name it, everything is basically um, telegraphing that we think women are much more fragile and need much more protection than men do. We'll never say that out loud because they're just the same as, as, as men are. And nobody is ever going to reconcile. Well, what does feminism stand for now? Does it stand for the fact that men and women should be treated exactly the same? Or does it stand for a little bit seasoned with a kind of sense of chivalry and, you know, <laughs> the delicate flowers? Uh, I'm giving, can I give you another example? I just thought of it. That's uh, probably else. So it reminded me of something I hadn't thought about in years. If you're a man and you, and you have to get a shot in the butt by a, by a nurse— and you take down your pants and, and, the, and the nurse says, oh, cute butt, right? Yeah. A man would giggle. Oh, thank you. you know, <laughs> no man would ever be bothered by that. He'd be flattered. 
the reverse. If you're a woman and you have to take down your butt for you know some male nurse and he says cute butt, you're gonna fucking sue. Am I wrong, Periel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're wrong. <laughs> and now this is a cute example, but it but it's not a, a meaningless example because you can extrapolate from that. Like they're like we who are we kidding? No, we no, we no, don't no, no, think no. everybody's the same. That's completely unprofessional. So, what do you mean? Any a nurse telling a guy that he has a cute butt before like she sticks her finger in your ass to no, check I, your po- prostate? I, like I, is I, that? I wouldn't care as I think as I think what he's. Say it. I mean, I, I can't imagine most men caring. Don't interrupt her. I like where she's going with this. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I would not be um, offended. I would not feel sexually harassed. I might question um, just how good a doctor she is. If, like if she's got a screw loose and she would say something like that, well, maybe she's not that competent. How 20- about this? Wait a second. What if the <laughs> what if the nurse were a man and he said that to you? You would still think it? Would you just blow it off? Because I think that's actually a better. I, I, I wouldn't care. There are plenty of men who are, as it were, homophobic. Who no, would, no, no. Who, you don't have to be homophobic to. I'm saying I wouldn't care about that. I would. I wouldn't be outraged, but I wouldn't be flattered quite in the same way if a, if a girl said it. Oh, to me. okay. But I'm assuming mirror image heterosexual situations. Male heterosexual nurse, female patient. You know, I'm, I'm assuming it. Just listen. Let's not pretend. All right. The second. Finally. Uh, this is the last thing I, I meant to bring it up. So your your statement about interpreting the agenda of people by the issues that they're concerned about. This also disturbs me about the people who are or are harping on the trans issues. Now I am I I, I don't think a, a, a college male swimmer ought to be able to change his bathing suit and and then you know <laughs> blow all the female. Um, swimmers out of the water. I'm, I, you know, th- I, I'm not for that. And there's some other common sense issues I'm not for. On the other hand, it makes my skin crawl the glee with which so many people ridicule trans people. And so, for instance, you know, it's all fun and games for these people until at some point someone you care about, like I have a very close friend who became trans, or someone in your family, I have a very close friend whose daughter uh, went through stuff. Someone you care about becomes, you know, trans. Or, and, and then your concern becomes, I want this person who I love to be able to have a fulfilling life in a world that's not cruel to them. And then all of a sudden, your, your way you look at it will immediately change. This would happen to... Matt Walsh or anybody else out there is it like you say like uh prisons yeah there was a prison right well when I think about my friend who's trans if he if God forbid he ever had to go to a prison if they put him in a male prison they she, would fucking tear him limb she, for limb she okay, put, her, put her in a male prison they would they would tear her limb for limb they would rape her they would abuse her she she might she, she might find her hanging in her cell like the the shallowness with which people address this issue I think really does say something about their motivations, even if on many of these aspects, I I agree with them. I don't know if you have any comments and all that. I don't even know where you stand on that stuff. Yeah. I mean, there are people who just dislike homosexuality, dislike any kind of gender nonconformity. I mean, and of course there's a backlash to trans, a lot of it justified, you know, a lot of it, I think that it's kind of become a, a, you know, a social panic among kids, a kind of a social contagion. Um, uh, yeah, I, yeah that, I, I agree with that. I think that's true. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think that there is like just an anti-gay stuff that's out there. I think that focusing on trans actually is like the biggest issue in the country is also a sign that you just really, really hate homosexuality because, you know, if it's in your top three or five issues, um, I think you're overrating it. So that probably tells you something too, just how much emphasis people put on it. Is it possible that, I mean, because you see this on the left too, I always thought that wokeness is really just an excuse for bullying. Is it possible that we all always need something to hate? Like we need we need something, a lightning rod for this kind of primitive aspect of our personalities and you know, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's weird because you'll see some people like, uh, you know, they'll talk about Leonardo DiCaprio likes younger girls, and it's like, wait a minute, when we stop judging people based on their sexual orientation, suddenly we judge them for being too old with too young of a woman. Or sometimes people will judge a race preference, say if you're white, you should have just want to date someone uh, who's white. So it seems like there is a conservation of a of a sexual judge, especially on sex. 
Yeah. Like we feel like we have to judge people for based on a sexual, a, a sexual or romantic decisions. And that seems to, yeah, it's very rare to find people who just are non judgmental about these things. Uh, oh, I know you got to go. There's something else that I saw you, you, you write somewhere, which also really rang true to me, which is that you notice that, that nobody gets anything right. I, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. Like, over time, this economist, that economist, everybody's, you know, the, the sky is always falling, and you get to live to be a certain age. You're quite younger than I am, but it's been my conclusion after seeing some, you know, kind of getting on board with so many people warning me that this is going to happen, that's going to happen. Say, so, you know, they don't know, and things are never that bad, and things kind of work out. What do you think about all that? Yeah, I mean, I'm a big fan of prediction markets. I mean, I, I I put probabilities on things that I predict. If I say, you know, there's going to be a, you know, Trump is going to be the nominee, I'll say people 70 percent. You could actually, you know, calculate how people, how good people are. This should be sort of, I think, mandatory uh, for, for pundits. I think people should just do it as, as best practices. And you're right. I mean, people are often... Uh, People are often wrong, but you know we could try to have good epistemological habits, and we could sort of try to hold ourselves accountable, and that's really the best we can do. All right, Richard, go ahead, Dan. Uh, that I don't know if you write about this or think about this, but my gut tells me you have an opinion, and it's reasonable and interesting. Bitcoin. <laughs> Well, I don't know when this is going to be released, but I have a podcast. I just did a podcast on uh, with somebody who knows a lot about uh, cryptocurrency. So, so far, I've just been listening to some guys who are really into cryptocurrency, and they've just, I've just been taking their investment advice. One told me to invest in uh, Dogecoin about a week ago. I've got like a 35% return in a week, which is pretty good. Wow. Um, so, you know, taking these guys' advice has been good so far. Uh, but uh, yeah, listen to the podcast. It's going to be on my newsletter. It's going to come out probably by the time people uh, hear this. And um, I'm, I'm still in the process of, of learning myself. I'm just taking the advice from smart people who've proved to, you know, uh, who've uh, made me money in the past. But I don't have deep specialized knowledge. I, I hope to get that soon. Are you bullish on America in general? I am. I mean, I think just the, the uh, economic you know, data, the numbers, they don't lie. We're just, we're just blowing past uh, Europe. Um, I, I want to write an article, but basically, uh, you know, I might want to write an article about this. I actually do think it's our polarization um, that is, uh, to a large extent, the benefit. I mean, I think we uh, we end up sometimes with good policy just because there's sort of red states and blue states, and they try different things and they fight over it. And we actually do end up with better results overall. Uh, so yeah, I am bullish on the United States. A, a, glo a global look at a comparative advantages of every country on earth. Does any country have more advantages than America? Um, no, I mean, as far as like how we're, I mean, you know, Qatar or UAE or stuff, you're, you know, you're just sitting on oil wealth and you could just live off that, you know, your life is pretty easy. Uh, but no, I'd rather be here than anywhere. Some places have less crime. Some people have less disorder. I mean, if you just want to sort of have an exciting life with the greatest possibilities, I don't think there's a better place to be. Yeah. I, I think, you know, like in video games, like my kid plays it, like the, if the racing game, they'll have a car and I'll have like. 10 different aspects of the car, acceleration, traction, blah, 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 steering. I think America, between our fantastic system, our youth, our resources, our, uh, you know, just, just, you, you just go again and again and again. Sure, this policy may be bad. We might have to correct it. There's definitely problems. I don't see any country um, with our just tremendous advantages. I'm, I'm very positive in the long term about America. I really wish we could get past this cultural period and, and, and get to, you know, when I was a kid, it was conceivable that a president could win 45, 50, uh, 48 states. And it happened, you know, real landslides happened with some regularity. Uh, I would like America to, I would like that to be possible again in America, that somebody, some presidential candidate could win a huge landslide. That would say something about our culture being repaired. Yeah, I think I'm a little bit more ambivalent about that. I actually think the fact that they can't do that is sort of might actually be one of our strengths. But, you know, it's something I, I, I want to think about more. I think there is something to say for the, the polarization. Well, maybe both. It may, maybe good things come out of it. But, um, yeah, sword, I, yeah. Uh, we, we, you know, we are really at each other's throats in a certain way. All right, we could go. It, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. You, you have been a, a great guest. And, um, if anybody else has to say, check out Richard's book. I can't recommend it enough. I don't, and I don't just say that about you know books that people have written who come on the show. It is really you will not be able to put it down. I was up late reading it, and I plan to finish what's it on the, my what's Kindle. What's the name of the book now? The, what, origins what, what, of Woke. Richard, what's that? It's the the origins of woke civil rights law. Oh, uh, the origins of woke corporate America and the triumph. Do, of do you do you um, of woke, we'll get it. 
No, do you give more put more stock into his explanation of the origins of wokeness or Yasha Monk? So they both have they both have their uh, good points. Well, <clears throat> I don't know. I mean, definitely, what Richard wrote made made more sense to me in the sense that I it, it jibed with my experience. Um, and I'm you know I'm about halfway through it. My gut is that while both things were true, what he says is is closer to the reason that major corporations are coming out for policies which make no sense from a business standpoint or profit standpoint or anything. So, you know, that that didn't come from Foucault. I think that came from <laughs> legal and system, sy systemic pressures. Yeah. And then, uh, so I, th I think on that one, now, then, you know, you maybe breaks down into finer gradations of issues. Maybe Yasha is right. Yasha's a friend of mine, so um, it's almost impossible for me to take yeah. sides I against mean, them. They don't have to be seen as like, you know, if you believe one, you can't believe the other. I mean, they're, they, they're, there's different parts of reality. Yeah. There is sort of the ideas. There's a civil rights law, which sort of forms the pipeline for the way the idea is to just influence and take over institutions. Uh, so I think if people are interested in the issue, they should read a wide range of books and not, not think there's just like one thing that explains I mean, to, to, to in a nutshell, the, 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 the story of civil rights law you know, coming out of Jim Crow and then America flailing about to try to get a more equal society, which it naively thought was just going to happen by, you know, a stroke of a pen. Everything that followed from that seems kind of predictable and um, seems like it would have happened regardless of any philosophical underpinnings in, in academia. It seems like these would be the trial and error steps that America would have to take as each smaller reaction fizzled. That, that's why I think you're basically right. I think that's a good point. And you can look across the world. I mean, racial preferences for groups that underperform are, you know, I'm not going to say universal, but they're very, very common all over the world. So, I mean, you, you get this stuff just through the sort of the interaction of politics. Yeah. All right, sir. We kept you long, past, past the time. Thank you very, very much. Yeah. Take it easy. Thank you. Bye. All right, uh, podcast at comedyseller.com, everybody. Take it easy. Bye.